sin Who knew no sin We might become His righteousness Humbled Himself Carried the cross Love so amazing Love so amazing Jesus Messiah If you don't have a Bible, raise your hand. We're going to put a Bible in your hand this morning as we look uh, at Ephesians chapter 4, verses 7 through 12. It is uh, quite a bit, uh, some deep passages. A few people from first service said, it's a lot, Pastor. You might want to cover, re-go over it next week um, because of uh, uh, what we're studying. So, anyway... Well, Clark has blessed the, uh, the service. He's prayed over it. So we're just going to go ahead and dive in. The title of this morning's message out of Ephesians 4, 7 through 12 is Unity at Work Through Gifts of Grace. Through Gifts of God's Grace. <clears throat> Paul, Paul's been describing the foundation of, the ch- of church unity and explaining main reasons for maintaining that. This unity Paul is proclaiming is not a suggestion or an optional extra. Not something we should just think about, but it's 
what we should be, uh, we're exhorted to, uh, to be, a, you know, to continue in, be a part of. Um, it's not something, once again, that we manufacture. I said last week that, that we don't manufacture this unity, and we're not striving to, to be unified. If we come together in Christ, we're unified. He's done the work of unity. We need to just rest in that. We need to, to abide in it, so to speak. Now, the connection between unity and spiritual gifts given to the church will prove, once again, to be accomplished by the life, death, and resurrection slash ascension of Jesus Christ. Now, every major thought, every major doctrine comes back to Jesus and what Jesus has done on the cross. Everything that you read, everything you think about, Christianity in that way is so simple. It's always about Jesus. Keep it about Jesus, and we'll always stay on the right track. Amen? And that's what Paul does this morning in, as he connects unity and he unifies again the church and he, and he equips the church through God gifts of grace, and and offices within the church for the establishment and the exhortation of the church that we'll see this morning. So let's go ahead and get into it. Ephesians 4, beginning in verse 7. Paul says, But to each one of you, or to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, he says, when he ascended on high, He led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. Now this, or no, so we know this, he ascended. What does it mean but that he also first descended into the lower parts of the earth? He who descended is also the one who ascended far above all heavens, that he might fill all things. And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. Verse 12, for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body. And we'll stop there. That is going to be a lot that we look into. The giving of spiritual gifts to the church. He says now, to each one grace was given. And he takes our thought back just previously when Paul said, but there is one body, there is one spirit, just as you were called into one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. He's using this one. He's he's establishing that there's not many ways, there's not many truths, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. But he's using this one. It makes it very, very special. But here he continues that idea and connects us with this living God, this one true living God, by saying right here in four and seven, excuse me, of four, but to each one of us. That relationship right here that's vertical, and you've got horizontal relationship. If we don't have this one right, these, none of these relationships will ever be right to each one of us. Now, he's going to talk about, you know, the whole apostles and prophets and, and evangelists and pastors and teachers. But the variety of gifts that God uses within the body of Christ are much larger for the exhortation and for the edifying and the equipping of the saints. Just not these specific offices that he's going to talk about, but also be thinking about all the gifts in all the gifts that we possess in this room, there's one body. And Jesus is the head of that one body. And so there's a multitude of gifts that are operating. Just not the ones mentioned. So each one of us, he makes it personal, according to the measure of Christ's gift. Now grace was given. We all received it according to this measure. This measure of Christ's gift. Guys, It all comes right here. He's taking it back to the cross. What was the gift of Christ? We learned in Sunday school that Jesus is a gift. Salvation is a gift. The work of the cross is a gift. But that gift just doesn't stop there. You know, everything that we have, everything we are in Christ flows from 
the gospel. It flows from the work that Jesus applied and did on the cross. Everything continues. And so it's measured by that. This grace is, that is dealt to the body, this measure, this gift of grace, it's, it's measured by that. Now that's a pretty big work. Amen? You see, no one else could do that. There's no one, no one, not one person in humanity could die for the sins of the world. But it had to be God. And we'll learn that Jesus Christ came down. 100% God and 100% man. And he came and he gave his life. He humbled himself. Right? Just, and, and, and it speaks of his incarnation as a human. And then as, as he's in his life and he goes to the cross. But here we have this measure of Christ's work that's dealt out to the church in, in the idea of gifts for the equipping of the saints. Guys, I, there's a lot of things that you will never understand if your God is this small, itty bitty little God. Allow God to just continue to reveal to you how big His God, how He, how big He is. Because if your God's small, then this scripture doesn't mean a whole lot. But if your God is big, it means a whole bunch. And so it's been measured out. I like to carry a 25 foot Stanley tape measure. Right? Nothing's worse than when you go to measure something, you got a 12 footer and you're like, ah! And you throw it across the room. Where's my 25 foot? You know, you've got to have something to measure something by, right? I've got, I've got 25 foot, I've got a 50 footer, I've got a 100 foot tape. Right? But you know what? <laughs> Listen, I can't measure this. So when it comes to God equipping the church, it's in an unmeasurable amount of grace. In this room, there are some gifts. Amen. God is working. Amen. So he says, therefore. Now he's quoting Psalm there, and he's quoting Psalm 68, 18. And if you would, turn with me there. While you're turning, I'm going to read Ephesians 8. While you're turning to Psalm 68, 18. Therefore, he says, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive, is what he's saying. Let's read what it says in Psalm 68 regarding this prophecy of David. It's a prophecy of Jesus Christ. You have ascended on high. You have led captivity captive. You have received gifts among men, even from the rebellious, that the Lord God might dwell there. This is is a very interesting passage. So let me work with you a little bit on the prophecy that David is giving and that Paul is alluding to. There is a connection there, although the verbiage is a little bit different. Primarily, we'll see in the psalm that it says that the Lord will receive gifts. And here, in Ephesians, Paul says that he's giving gifts, right? That he gives gifts to men because of this work. Now, let's go back to Psalm 68. This prophecy is rooted in this idea, the idea of a general, a victorious general coming back from conquering and triumphing over his enemy. And this general, and this is in history, he would come back through the city, just so picture the city of Jerusalem. As this general, he's coming back victorious, and it'd be like a parade through the city. And the general would be in a chariot up at the front. And following that general would be captives. Those prominent people of the city or country that he had just cap captured would be following him in chains, bound. And behind that would be the rest of the soldiers and the army. And they would be dis distributing, distributing excuse me, the, the spoils or bounty of this victory. The things that they had taken by conquering this other city. And so the idea here is that here in, 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 in here, he had received gifts. The Lord had received gifts from his victorious work on the cross. What did he receive? He, re he received uh, uh, the right hand of the Father. What he accomplished, what Jesus accomplished on the cross was huge, enormous for us. 
But it, here it places him at a place that he, he even wasn't prior. He will come back. How will he return to the earth? On a horse, right? As a mighty warrior, victorious. He's not coming back to fight. The battle's won. And so here, there's a connection between the two. David, he's presenting the Lord as a conquering, victorious, triumphal, uh, mighty king or, or general. And here in Ephesians, he's drawing that point. And he's saying that, that these gifts that he has received because of the work on the cross, he now gives to us. It's a gift of grace. It's an extension. If you want to know, uh, this idea is, was wonderfully preached by Matthew Henry in the 1700s. This, this idea of this connection between these two is gigantic. And so he says, when he ascended on high, well, first, he, he, when he did that, he led captivity captive. These captives, their chains are broken because of the cross. They are set free because of his victorious work on the cross. And now we've got the spoils of this victory are ours. This work of grace is what he is saying. And then he goes on and would say, now, it says here, now this, he ascended. What does it mean? Well, if he ascended, then he first descended. He first descended. Now, the idea here, if you would, the idea is he's, it says in Scripture that he, he descended to the lower parts of the earth. That's exactly what it says. Now, a lot of folks would uh, take this lower parts of the earth to speak of his, uh, him going down to, the, to Hades and preaching to those in Hades. Right there spoken of in 1 Peter 3, 19 and 1 Peter 4, 6. That work took place. Jesus did that. That's exactly what he did. But that's not what he's talking about here. Here he's talking about how Christ humbled himself. When he came to the lower parts of the earth, it talks about just coming to earth. It speaks of his incarnation and it speaks of his burial, being buried in the earth. It speaks of his work, his humble work on the cross before he ascended. So when we look at this, we can say, well, okay, yeah, he, he went to the lower parts of the earth and he, sp and he preached to the spirits in prison there in Hades, but, but that's not what he's talking about because here he's talking about the unity of the church and he's connecting us together. And how did he do that? If we look back up in four, we see he says that we're to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called with all lowliness, gentleness, long-suffering, bearing with one another in love. He's challenging us to take a humble approach at walking worthy before Jesus Christ, before him, in faith. That's how we keep the, the, this bond of unity in the spirit of peace. Right? So, so here in our text, in the context of what he's saying, he's saying that he... Before he ascended, he first descended. Jesus humbled himself as a man. He came to the cross, or came to the earth, and, he, and, then he, and here he, he took our sin upon himself. He suffered. He was broken before he ascended. This work is the work of grace that is the gift it makes us think a little bit about how we live our lives. Once again, we look to the cross as our perfect example. And we look to the life of Jesus as our demonstration and illustration of how we should live our lives. These words suggest that Jesus... Uh, Jesus' state of exaltation was preceded before he ascended... He was, he was humbled and came to the earth. David speaks of this. 
Let's put Psalm 139.15 up. Regarding his incarnation or his birth as he came to the earth, the psalmist also penned this psalm. My substance was not hidden from thee when I was made in secret and curiously wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. He's clearly speaking of his incarnation. And David further wrote regarding his burial in Psalm 63, 9. Those that seek my soul to destroy it shall go into the lower parts of the earth. He calls his death, his descent into the lower parts of the earth. He describes, or excuse me, he descended to the earth in his incarnation. Jesus descended into the earth regarding his burial. He that descended is the same also that ascended. He ascended up far above all heavens. Not halfway. He didn't go just up into the sky. He's speaking directly of going to heaven here. Into the heavens of heavens that he might fill all things, all the members of his church with the gifts of graces suitable for their severe conditions and situations. That's exactly what he's done. All ministers, all members of Christ owe all these gifts of grace to him. All these gifts of grace belong to him. Moving forward, let's look at verse 11. And he himself, it says, gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. Now many would call this the fivefold ministry. But in the Greek, it's not the fivefold ministry. It's the fourfold. Looking at these real quickly, you see that it says, and he gave some to be apostles, and some prophets, some, but between pastors and teachers, it just says and, pastors and teachers. That's in the Greek, it, that's, that's one. It's one specific uh, uh, you know, word, so to speak. Speaking of one specific title, if you would. And so when we look at this, Let's talk a little bit about a prophet. He gave some to be a prophet's. This fourfold office. Offices to the church. Offices for the working together. For unity. And for the growth and edification of the church. God gave these. This wasn't some, somebody, the, the apostles didn't even think this up. You know, it's important to understand. What we... We need to have these leaders. We need to have these in the church. There are a lot of church organizations today that say we don't have any specific leaders, such as the Jehovah's Witnesses. They have, they have elders. Their head is in New York City. They have elders that float around and, and, and speak, but, but they, they have one major group that they get all their, all their information from, so to speak. But here, God has ordained these offices. And the work of apostle... Apostle means someone who is sent out or has been sent by God. An apostle is a very special ambassador towards God's work. Now today, the question is always goes, well, do we have apostles today? We don't have apostles today. If you think about the work of an apostle, right? An apostle was sent out by God. He was sent out. To, to, for, the, for the planting of the churches, for the exhortation of the gospel. And he was, they were sent out for the writing of, of, of scripture. And so we have, we have a lot of different ideas regarding this apostleship. Now some churches, they, they, they call people apostles and they have active prophets. But to say that we have apostles today is a, difficult, is a long stretch. Now, I think we have people in the world today that operate within the spirit of apostle. Let me give an example. For me, I think of Pastor Chuck Smith. Had the spirit of an apostle. Not because of what he did, but because of what God did through him. 
when you look at the planting of the churches and how many churches and, and you know, the work that God did with him early on, and it was all centered around the word of God. But an apostle's writing scripture You know, a very specific role that the apostles had in the first century church that we don't have today. Why? Because there's no further revelation. If somebody says, hey, you know, if I've got more great revelation. Now, if I was to write a letter to you, after you read it, it could be this greatest letter. Thousands of people could read it and be built up and the church can be uh, exhorted and lifted up by it. But are you going to take that letter and make millions of copies and start putting them back behind Ephesians? Probably not. Okay? The work of a prophet we're going to go back to is, again, a prophet is one whose whose word is consistent with the word of God. There's no further revelation, no greater revelation. And so when I think of an apostle or a prophet, I'm thinking of somebody that's bringing greater revelation or more, or additional revelation. Not needed. Okay? In that sense. So, the twelve. Let's talk. The twelve apostles, they were called by Jesus. They were trained by Jesus. They were equipped to serve Jesus. And they were sent into the world by Jesus. The twelve apostles were called and anointed by Christ to serve with His authority. Now, that's a, that's a big deal. I want to teach God's word because I'm called by God to teach his word. And I pray that he, I, he, I'm filled with his spirit as I do it. But, but be careful when you say, thus saith the Lord. You know, I mean, that's, that's a big deal, right? You rarely, you, you're not going to hear me say that. I, I'm rarely going to say, thus saith the Lord, unless I'm, I'm repeating letters in red. You follow me? This, is what expl- this explains why their letters were regarded and received as divine authority. They were apostles. And today, when we lift up apostles, we want to receive what they have to say as divine authority. That's dangerous. Amen? Okay. So, now let's look at uh, the role of a prophet. A prophet. Prophets are those who speak forth, again, the words of God with total, complete, entire consistency with the word of God. You see, the position in which the apostles appear here suggests that Paul is also thinking of the special ministry that stood alongside of and complemented that of the apostles. To reveal God's word, to reveal God's will, and to reveal God's purpose for the church. Again, uh, this speaks of, of what was happening in the early church. Prophets. Now, first I want to, again, we can go back to 1 Corinthians and talk about all these variety of gifts that are operating in the church today. He's talking about really four specific operations of offices within the church. Here, bringing unity to the body of Christ. But we know that the, 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 the word prophecy or prophet is, is kind of vague. Are they operating the same way they did in the first century church? I really don't think so. But are there prophets today? And, and is the gift of prophecy alive? I sure hope so. Amen? Paul doesn't say in 1 Corinthians, Oh, no, stop that. You know, stop speaking in tongues. Stop prophesying. Stop with the word of knowledge. I get up here and I hope that the gift of knowledge is operating in my life on Sunday morning on a daily basis. Right? So, but... The idea between the, the idea behind this this being prophetic, we have to be very careful. If somebody comes up to me and says, "Hey, pastor, you know, I, I've just I've got a word of the Lord, from the Lord for you," I'm going to go, "Hey, yeah, great, come on over here, you know, lay it on me, you know, I don't want to listen, but I am going to judge it and make sure it's consistent with the Word of God and with what God's doing in my life." And so too you should. In fact, Scripture in First Corinthians fourteen twenty nine. 
it, it challenges us. It says, let two or three prophets speak and let the others judge. So be careful. If you're going to speak for the Lord, or if you're going to speak the words of, of God into somebody's life, you better be ready to be judged. And I don't mean that like in a bad way, but hey, we're going to judge you and make sure it's consistent with, what, with God's word. That's, a, that's an important deal. So, evangelists, you know these guys. They blow in, they blow up, and they blow out. <laughs> Everybody wants to be an evangelist. Who doesn't want to be Billy Graham? You know what I'm saying? You know, the work of an evangelist was simply and still today is to, is to go out and to teach God, or to spread the gospel, you know, to, to lead people to Jesus, so to speak. Now, what's very interesting is he's got these four offices, but if we go back to 2 Timothy, and we begin right there in, in 2 2, we can look. Let's just flip there. We've got time. Go to 2 Timothy 2 2. If you find 1 Timothy, then you're pretty close. Amen. Paul, writing to young Timothy, his son in the faith. Timothy is, ironically, in Ephesus, sent by Paul, the young pastor, to pastor this group that we're reading about this morning. And he says in 2, 2, And the things that you have heard from me among many witnesses... Commit these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Right? He is exhorting him. Exhorting him to raise up others. Commit these things, these words of mine. And then you look over to, to uh, 3.17. 3.17. Flip the page. And he says this. Well, let's look at 16. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. He says, for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. This is building. Now let's look at right over the, across the page to chapter 4, verse 2. He tells Timothy, preach the word. Be ready, in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long-suffering and teaching. Be humble with what you're doing. And in five, but you be watchful in all things. Endure affliction and do the work of an evangelist. Fulfill your ministry. If we look at this, some of these roles operate in some more than just one. It's not like you've got to pick one. Well, I'm going to, you know, there's not just an apostle or there's just not the prophet. But he's challenging Timothy, the young pastor teacher, to do the work of an evangelist. And also as one who's sent out to equip others with the knowledge of God's word as he's been equipped. So we, we'll see how this works. And we see how God is, is working together. It's not just one or the other. But as we look at pastor, teacher, this is one specific office. An office that's so important. And, and the most important today is pastor, teacher. You know, there's a lot of pastors that are, that, that are teachers. But what's a shame is there's not very many teachers that are very good pastors. Not all teachers are pastors. Amen. You see, specifically in our movement, I've seen that we have got incredible Bible colleges. And the focus is on the word, on the word, on the word. And so they are equipped, thoroughly equipped to preach and to teach God's word. You know, to fill your minds and your hearts full of amazing truths from God's word. But some of them aren't very good pastors. When it comes to sitting with you and holding your hand and praying with you, loving you, walking with you through your life and through your struggles, you see, that's, that's a huge deal. Now, all pastors, 
shepherds, shepherding God's flock. They need to preach the word. They need to be teachers, as Paul told Timothy. Preach the word. They need to be out there spreading the gospel, as he told them, to do the work of an evangelist. But to the teacher, remember to have a pastor-shepherd-like heart. You know, if you're going to go out there and, and you're going to teach, remember to maybe every now and then close your mouth and shut the book and sit down and just sit with somebody and pray with somebody. Just be there for them. Walk with them through their struggles. Encourage them through their difficulties. That's a huge deal. And that's a primary role in the church today that, that where God is working, God is moving. I you know, everybody wants to be an evangelist. Everybody wants to be, you know, a prophet or a, an apostle. Why? Because those names are big. But a shepherd, a shepherd, a pastor, to be perfectly honest, that, that's, that's not a fun job all the time. It's kind of a stinky sh- job. When you're hanging out with the sheep, you get dirty when you're taking care of the sheep. When you're tending to the sheep, right? You're gonna, it's messy. It's messy work. You know, that's why a lot of us just, Love teaching the word. I just want to teach the word, man. In private, I've sat with many pastors that said, man, if I could just teach the word and let somebody else do everything else, that'd be awesome. If I could just do that. But that's not the case. That's not the case at all. Jesus, Jesus, man, he had a, he had a heart for people. He connected with people all through the gospels. And it's a really good example. It's a good, it's a good word to me this morning, if you want to know the truth, to do this, to stick it out. And so we have the work of an evangelist. We have pastors and teachers. 1 Corinthians 12, 11. He says, but one and the same spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually as he wills. God is at work. God gives the gift. If it's a work of his spirit, God does it. The importance of having all four operations in any church body, well, that's entirely up to Jesus. One commentator said, he gives the gifts. But in closing, let's read 12. For the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry, and for the edifying of the body of Christ. (laughs) Now here's where the rubber meets the road. This is where the rubber meets the road. All all of this, and and we've got to go back, and we've got to understand the flow of Paul's thought. He calls us in chapter 4. I told you this is the beginning of it. He he changes. it's, it's It's a bridge in this book. Chapter 4, verse 1, is the first serious exhortation. Walk worthy of the calling which with you were called. And he's, then he begins to lay out this work of unity. And he talks about the unity of the Spirit. He establishes his headship and godship in our lives. In the authority that he has. In working this unity. Listen, if God is not your authority then you're going to have a problem with having unity with anybody else if God's not your authority. Secondly, if he is not the one who descended to earth and he's not that humble Savior who ascended into glory for you, then you're going to have a hard time with unity and you're going to have a hard time following his direction and obedience in your life. In understanding his role in the offices that he has planted, all for the exhortation and encouragement and edifying work of the church. These are gifts, along with all the other gifts, these are gifts. Gifts from God to the body. That, that they might be equipped. That the saints, it doesn't say that a few of them, it doesn't say that, that we should, you know, form a denomination that focuses just strictly on equipping the saints for the work of the ministry. 
No, this is God's specific role for the church and for the leaders of the church. This this is his purpose, that we grow in God's word and grow closer to him. Your spiritual growth is, is priority number one in your life. Not how high you can jump or how loud you can sing or not how many great things you can do or how much you can serve. No, primarily... Primarily, it is, it is right here. How, 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 how much are you receiving? How much are you getting? Are you growing? Are you being challenged? Equipping for all, it's all the saints and for the work of the ministry. Some people say, well, I just, you know, I don't know what I'm called to do. I don't, I don't know what to do. Man, there's so much to do. There's so much to do. And, and, and it's not cleaning the church. There's needs. There's not, it's not Sunday school. It's not, it's, not that kind of, it's not that kind of thing. Guys, there's, there's work to do in living your life for Jesus. There's work to do in spreading the gospel. And, and another thing, he's talking about these roles here in the church. But, but can I tell you, it wasn't the preacher on Sunday morning that did the biggest work in my life when I was younger, but it was the person sitting next to me in the pew of the churches that I've attended. You see, as Denise and I have grown in our faith, we were encouraged by the people sitting next to us that were just a mile down the road further than us, maybe two, maybe 10. And we sat underneath them and we hung out with them and we prayed with them and we studied the word with them and we shared life with them. And I was able to open up and share my struggles with them and the difficulties and I grew, and I grew, and I grew. So this just isn't on the part of the evangelist, or the prophet, or the pastor, teacher. Every one of us has a role for the edifying of the body, and for the work of the ministry. Every one of us has a role. I was encouraged by countless people, countless people in their walk with the Lord. They said, man, Raj, I, you know, let, me, let me share with you. I remember I was a new Christian, New in the Lord. And, and I had no problems, you know, with a lot of stuff. I, a lot of stuff just fell off like scales off a of fish like that. But when I was a new believer, because I wasn't raised in a Christian home, I could swear with the best of them. I had the most filthiest mouth. As one lady says, you eat out of that same mouth? You eat out of, with that same mouth? Boy, I could cuss with that best sailor out there, boy. And I'd be on the job, man. 27 years ago, I'd let them rip. I'd let let language fly. Woo, man. And then they'd start saying, hey, Christian. They, they, they knew I'd give my life to the Lord because I'd also shared that with all the guys I worked with. And, and uh, they were just, they laid into me, man. So I'd go to my Friday night Bible study, this couple that were discipling us. It wasn't a church thing. It was just discipleship. We, they were just loving on us and walking with Denise and I. And I'd share with Mike, and Mike was a superintendent. In, 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 with another company and he, he he was so cool he just walked around with his cup of coffee and he had these relationships with people here's this electrician he's up on a ladder got his head stuff in the ceiling he he didn't come by and say hey when's that gonna be done he said hey bob what's going on bob poke his head down hey not much hey you know you still that pickup truck you're working on you, you know he's building a relationship with this guy oh by the way you can be done oh don't worry about it mike it'll be done by noon you see and, and, and i watched the relationships this guy had well so then i asked him I said, man, I, I swear like a sailor at work, and I don't know what the deal is. I said, I don't know how to stop. And he told me, he says, Raj, every time, he said, just drop whatever's in your hand and just stop and just pray. Close your eyes and just pray out loud. God, forgive me, help me to stop doing this. You know, so I look like this mad person at work, right? I'm pouring concrete, I have a hand float, and I'd throw it on the ground, and I'm just like, God, help me, you know, and then I then... 20 minutes later, I'm like, yeah, you know, throwing these words out. I'm, God, help me. I looked like a, I mean, I would have fired myself. I looked like a total lunatic. But guess what? He was right. It worked. It worked. It took a little bit of time. But you know what? It worked. It worked. But it was because of the fellowship that I had. And I had people like that in my life that could encourage me in the silly things like that that we struggle with right? So build relationships because God wants to equip the saints. 
He wants to do a work in the ministry of your life. And if he's doing a work in the ministry of your life, he's going to do an amazing work in the church. Amen? Amen? Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you, God, so much. Uh, there was a lot here, and so I, I calmed it down, Lord, like you told me to. I calmed it down after first service. Lord, I ask that you would just bless these folks. I ask, God, that they would be encouraged, that they would leave here fed and built up in their faith, more in love with you. And, Lord, I pray for these relationships in the church. I pray, God, that you would do a great work there in their lives, uniting people together and, uh, and just watching what you do. So, Lord, just lead us on. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's go ahead and stand together. One last song. When we call upon your name, you will answer, you will save, and deliver us. In the darkness, in the storm, you are shining. Awesome. Well, while you guys are standing, just want to thank you guys for coming out. You know, I really want to encourage you guys to be praying for what God's doing here. Amen. There was, I, I don't know how many, there was like almost 30, there was like 25, I think, is what I was told, high schoolers. And the kids' room has got like, I mean, it looks like there's a hundred of them in there. I mean, <laughs> it, it is awesome. And, and guys, I mean, it is, God is just it's so good, man. It, it's, it's an awesome thing. 
But, uh, you know, be praying about what God's doing here. Be praying for a facility. Be praying how you can get plugged in and serve the Lord. It's, it's an awesome thing. Also, I uh, just want to encourage you guys, we have a men's retreat coming up, and the sign-up is out there on the table for this men's retreat, August uh, 19th through the 21st. And also the Faith and Family Night, get on that. And I just want to encourage you, man, be strong in the Lord, right? In the power of his might this week, let God lead you as a lamp unto your feet and a light unto your path. Amen? Amen. Love you guys. Have a great week.